before the break, I said that we would look and see what lied hidden behind the publicity. This is the article that I've been building up to, and I keep saying this article that was released in 2015. <clears throat> and here is the science that lays behind a lot of the publicity that we experienced as a result of the measles outbreak in 2014 and all of what we heard in 2015 from the media. The title looks very impressive, doesn't it? Because the study was partially funded by Bill Gates Foundation and, believe it or not, the Department of Home, United States Homeland Security, there were advanced Microsoft graphics that, while they were very pretty, were very intimidating. The explanatory language is totally inaccessible to most people, which was probably the intent from the start. As a former medical teaching professor, I know that it's actually the mark of a good teacher when the audience or student understands the message. <laughs> most doctors I've spoken to who saw the article can't get their heads around the analysis. <clears throat> it's not because they're dumb. The lead author is a medical student who appears to know very little about measles in the real world context, but by his own admission, he loves fiddling with stats using mathematical modeling. I've put this study in front of epidemiologists and people who have majored in statistics, and the results don't make real life sense to them either. So now we have a medical student partnering with a computer geek to produce statistical models so complex your eyes would glaze over. The important thing to the authors was to give parents a simple explanation. So this is what the public was told. They were told that measles disease is the cause of non-measles, infectious disease death, for three years after the measles infection, and that the measles vaccines prevent this problem. And the theory is that measles disease suppresses the immune system, causing immune amnesia for a long time after the infection. You get that? The problem with this hypothesis is that long-term immune suppression after measles disease was never a real phenomenon. The world's leading authority on non-specific effects of vaccines, now let me tell you what that means. A vaccine, you inject it, and the specific effect for, say, measles vaccine is that it will prevent you from getting measles. A non-specific specific effect could be that you die, or that you have a bad, you know, sore arm, or that you develop allergies, or in this case, that you live a long, healthy life longer than everybody else. <clears throat> So the world's leading authority tells us where this idea actually came from. It was a belief, not a fact. And that belief in long-term immune suppression came from a vaccine crisis that I actually never heard about. It occurred after a very high dose measles vaccine was given to four month old infants in Africa. That vaccine was associated with a twice higher death rate in those babies in the years following. So people thought, okay, the vaccine suppressed the immune system for a long time, and that must be the cause of the higher death. And then they thought, maybe the disease does the same thing. But it turned out that the high-dose measles vaccine was not totally responsible for those long-term deaths. It was the DPT vaccines that were given after the high-dose measles vaccines, and that was later determined. Diphtheria tetanus pertussis. So anybody want to say that in Danish? Okay. Everybody got it? Okay. And better yet, the measles disease does not relate to higher long-term mortality either. And here's the evidence. An article published in the journal Vaccine in 2002. Several studies show how much better children who had measles survived over the years following the infection compared to the uninfected controls. And here's one study that looked at it. And more closely, we can see that long-term mortality, or death, over a four-year period 
in measles exposed children after an epidemic. Based on blood testing that they did, children were categorized as either measles cases, subclinical, meaning they didn't have rash and everything, but the blood showed that they, they had uh, infection, subclinical measles cases, or uninfected contacts because they had no rash and no rise in antibody titer. So measles survivors did better long-term than children who didn't get measles at all. And most of those measles cases who did better were not vaccinated. There were no deaths at all during this epidemic and this study in Africa. This graph shows you the higher survival probability for having measles or subclinical measles. As you can see on the top, these are the people that had measles or subclinical measles. Survival is plotted here, much higher survival over the, uh, the, the following, I think it was four years. <clears throat> compared to those who had been exposed but had no or only slight immunity boost down here, these were labeled as the non-measles cases. And you can see that their survival was nowhere near as good over time. The difference between them was huge, and that's reflected in what we call the mortality ratio. If there's no effect, the mortality ratio would be 1.0. And if there was a beneficial effect to not having measles, the mortality ratio would be above one. And if there's a benefit to having the disease, the mortality ratio would be below one. And how far below one it is means how beneficial it was. 0 0.14, okay? That's a very low number that indicates a huge benefit of infection over the long term. So Dr. Orby, Dr. Peter Orby is the name, He's, and I know I'm saying it wrong, but I used to say Orby, and that's probably even worse. So Dr. Peter Orby realized that not just measles vaccines, but measles infection, like measles vaccine, had a good effect on the immune system, and that surviving measles was not associated with a higher long-term death rate. So according to the Danish doctor, Dr. Orby, even in the poorest places, children who survived infection, which in this study was all of them, did not have a higher death rate from other diseases later. Dr. Mina, who did the study that I just told you about in 2015, says that high acute measles death in Africa makes Orbe's data irrelevant. But there are two problems with that criticism. In some studies, Dr. Orby's death rates were either low or zero, and Dr. Orby says that even when there are acute deaths, meaning deaths right away when you get infected with measles, the benefit long-term over the period of years afterwards of how much survival there is compensates, well overcompensates for any acute deaths when those two groups are compared. He says, apparently, lower post-measles mortality compensates for acute measles mortality. And as a consequence, measles infection has a lower than expected overall impact on survival, meaning really on death. So in one respect, this, all this, is, this is all irrelevant in, the, in developed countries like the United States and Denmark because as Roman and I from Dissolving Illusion showed, the acute measles death rate was near zero before the vaccine came into use. So Mina's criticism is irrelevant. But even in impoverished African countries like Senegal, for instance, Dr. Orby found that there was no long-term mor term mortality following measles disease there either and their mortality rate was 0.27 in the infected index cases, means, meaning the ones that got it first and then spread it to others. He said the net impact of natural measles might be beneficial in situations with no acute mortality. <clears throat> and in another paper called Is Measles Good for Something? Dr. Orby said, contrary to current assumptions, Children who survive the acute phase of measles infection may have a survival advantage compared with unimmunized, uninfected children. Hence, both disease and immunization may be associated with nonspecific beneficial effects, presumably due to some form of immunostimulation. <clears throat> 
Denmark and other countries Mina studied would be the countries where survival of the acute infection was nearly universal. However, as you'll see later, Mina and the co-author Osterhaus don't want parents to know inconvenient concepts like measles disease is really good for something. All these studies were deliberately ignored because the focus of Mina's report was to unveil to the public a new concept, that measles leaves you vulnerable to a host of deadly diseases. Perhaps the authors looked at each other and said, what the public doesn't know, that won't matter because no one will bother to read our references and any of Orby's other work. We know the media will print it, whatever we say. Note the author's name, Deborah McKenzie, of this publicity article, because that's going to be important in a minute. But the focus of these publicity articles was not to doctors, because doctors just do as they're told. The focus was towards scaring the wits out of parents, and in particular, parents who didn't vaccinate their children. The problem was quickly identified, not measles, but the anti-vaccine movement. Immediately, they refuted the idea of measles being primarily a trivial illness. They used figures taken from some imaginary source saying that brain damage in two or three out of every 1,000 cases, or death, even in wealthy countries. Now, anyone who studied the case numbers, the complications, and the deaths from measles in any single high-income country knows that the death rate they quoted here would only have been seen in the 1800s or in the Great Depression or during food deprivation, population dislocation such as war and things like that. I've studied measles cases and deaths in different countries of the world, both poor and wealthy, and it's very clear in both medical journals and documents written by governments, by health officials, that in the Western world, measles was far less severe by the 1930s and considered relatively trivial by 1960. The death, gra the death decline graphs for many countries actually prove that. Parents clearly understand death decline the way we reported in Dissolving Illusions using long-term data directly from reliable sources. MENA used Denmark as one of the three countries in the analysis, so let's look at your pre-vaccine mortality chart. Death is in black, and incidence, or rates of measles disease, are in red. And there's where your vaccine came in. Note that as the death rate is declining from measles, the incidence was rising after the 1940s. Dr. Mina ignores the low acute measles deaths because his hypothesis is that those red measles cases led to immune system ablation, or amnesia, and an increase in other deaths from other infectious diseases up to three years after the measles infection. So let's transfer those measles cases to the Danish death decline data for some of the diseases which Mina singled out. And thanks to some Danes, I was able to get this information, and Roman put these graphs together showing you that pneumonia and other infectious disease deaths of children were landsliding, dropping rapidly, at the same time that the measles attack rates were still sky high before the vaccines. The dotted line are measles attack rates, or incidents, and this is the decline in pneumonia in 0 to 15-year-olds, and the blue line down here is in 0 to 14-year-olds, simply because the data was collected slightly differently in these two eras. And here in green, we have death from other infectious diseases uh, below the age of 15. So other infectious disease deaths were also declining way before the vaccine. So where is the huge exponential decrease that Mina claimed to have occurred after the measles vaccine was introduced? Another co-author of this paper named Brian Grenfell stated in the Princeton University press release that at a population level, the data suggests that when measles was rampant, it may have led to a reduction in herd immunity against other infectious diseases. So how does that stack up with the Danish official data shown here? It's ludicrous and it's totally unsubstantiated. <clears throat> 
Here is the Danish data analysis using all ages of children, which Mina specified in his article. And this one goes back to 1900, and we end in 2009. And we can see this is the measles attack rates in the red dotted line and the death rates in different age groups, zero to, fifth, zero to four years, sorry, this is total. This, this high line, and then we have one to four years old in the light blue, and then the older age groups are down here. So what's easy to see is a landslide fall in childhood infectious disease deaths, even when measles disease was rampant. In Dissolving Illusions, we give the history behind why this happened, and it had nothing to do with vaccines or antibiotics. There's no way to go back in time and try to single out one little sub-segment of the childhood measles population back then, or even now, with mathematical modeling to look for a hidden pattern of death two to three years after children had measles. Mina is simply hunting for ghosts, and in order to scare everyone into vaccinating. One of the key points you need to remember is that the first time that Mina and his co-authors ran the data with their first set of assumptions, they didn't actually see what they wanted to see. They had to change both their assumptions and the way they analyzed the data. It was as if they said, oops, that didn't work, so let's change our endpoints and theories to create answers for the message that we want to send. And that's what they did, which gave them the result that they wanted. But the real question of credibility of this study, fortunately, for those who aren't mathematicians, doesn't lie in the data manipulation at all. The big flaw in this study lies in the immunology assumptions, which was the second hypothesis. It stated that measles infection reduces the immune system memory to an empty shell, implying that all diseases for which one was vaccinated or had gained natural immunity to, once again, after the measles infection, became not just an individual threat that they could get infected again, but a community threat, as Dr. Grenfell alluded. So in order to sustain a hypothesis, you have to prove biological plausibility. Enter some monkeys and a researcher named De Vries, who hypothesized that while there must be immune memory erasure, they couldn't see it. Why? Because they thought that it was masked or covered up by an intense and specific immune response towards measles. In other words, they couldn't find the problem with the white blood cells that they were looking for because when people were infected, their immune system was working very hard against measles, and so they couldn't see where it was suppressed or immune ablated elsewhere. So note the word suggest. This is not fact. And when we look at the monkey references, which I read thoroughly several times, we read that, on one hand, they say, the memory lymphocyte populations specific for previously encountered pathogens are not completely depleted and are largely restored during the weeks to months after measles. But then you go to the end and it says, we conclude that measles virus infection wipes immunological memory resulting in an increased susceptibility to commensal, meaning the ones that live in you normally, or opportunistic infections. So this paper contains two contradictory statements, one which says the memory cells are not completely depleted, and another which says immunological memory is wiped, meaning wiped means wiped, right? So how can those two statements exist in the same paper? I don't know. There was a second paper here, which is heavily referenced, and it's not even research. It was a summary paper full of beliefs, hypotheses, theories, and models, no data. So Dr. Mina and Dr. Osterhaus are thanked for their critical comments to the manuscript. Note that. Both articles were heavily referenced by Mina as evidence of long-term T and B cell immune suppression even though Dr. Orby showed it doesn't happen in real life humans, even in Africa. Mina and obviously De Vries are banking on doctors being too busy to go and read the references. Because doctors are too busy to check, 
Nobody challenges anything. Most importantly, in the 2014 paper, thanking Mina and Osterhaus for their comments, the concluding sentence says, clinical studies are required to test our hypothesis that measles immune suppression is mainly a numbers game. Yet not five months later, after no clinical studies at all had been done, Mina and Osterhaus, who were thanked in this paper, are presenting mathematical models that they say validate a non-clinical monkey hypothesis. Yet Dr. Orby made it very clear that there was no persistent T lymphocyte immune suppression in infected children two months after infection. By then, everything was back to normal. He says, in this five-year follow-up study, he looked at vaccinated and unvaccinated uninfected controls, and also vaccinated and unvaccinated infected cases, measles infected. And he says, contrary to the initial expectations, this is a guy that's willing to see something that's contrary to his initial expectations, measles cases who survived the acute phase had lower mortality than controls. By two months, everything was back to normal. And after five years, the children who had measles had better survival, which proved that there was no lethal suppression. And this is the kind of things that they looked at. Compared with controls, they looked at differences in white blood cell count, lymphocyte, CD4, all kinds of things. And they found that the post-measles cases had a mortality rate ratio of 0.5. Again, that means having measles was very beneficial over the long term. So Mina would say that these kids' T cell counts, while normal, still had amnesia and couldn't protect them later from non-measles infections. But that can't be true because the survival rate was two times as high in the children who had measles compared to their more vaccinated, uninfected control counterparts. Vaccinated, uninfected controls also had more vaccines and a higher death rate. Here we have the cases, the ones who had measles, and you can see 38% of them were vaccinated. And this is their survival curve, much higher. And here are the ones that were vaccinated, uh, 60% were vaccinated. They didn't get measles disease. And look at how much lower their survival curve was. So Dr. Orby's research actually contradicts Mina's hypothesis commenting that four other studies in other countries also failed to find excess death rate, but instead found lower death rate in the post-measles period, which is the opposite of Mina's tenet and why he's telling us that we all need to get measles vaccinated. The English have a term in science called the faggot fallacy, which is the fallacy of supposing that multiple pieces of evidence each independently being weak or suspect, provides strong evidence when bundled together. <laughs> Mina, knowing the power of numbers, adds the third twig to his three-pronged faggot, which says that by removing pre-existing immunity, measles sets the child's body back to newborn status. And that's the cause of their death in the three years afterwards. How was this presented to non-vaccinating parents and the public? Co-author Osterhaus told the press that if their DTAP vaccinated child got measles, the measles infection would destroy immunity from the former vaccines that they had been given. A question. Does that mean that any established vaccine or natural immunity to disease that was achieved before a measles vaccine came on the market was neutralized by any measles infection that came after? If that was true, then huge amounts of the pre-measles vaccine era children would have lost their vaccine and their natural immunity. And diphtheria and whooping cough and tetanus should have gone out of control but that didn't happen, did it? What Mina and Osterhaus' hypothesis actually demonstrates is that Mina and Osterhaus' understanding of the newborn immune system and the development of neonatal immunity is flawed. Just listen to me instead of trying to take this in, because this is just proof of what I'm saying. 
it's not possible to set a child's immune system back to newborn status. I've done a long series on infant immunity that's on YouTube that goes into great detail on all of these studies that are here. If it was possible to set a child's immune system back to newborn status, it would have applied to every child born until a measles vaccine was introduced. And what they are saying now couldn't happen, didn't happen. But apart from the obvious proof that this is a fallacy, a newborn has an immune system which has fundamental differences to the immune system of an older child. And this is something that they're just beginning to understand in more detail. The latest medical literature on the subject, which I have listed up here, proves that the old thinking that babies are born defective is totally false. It's very helpful if you're trying to sell vaccines, though. Many old paradigms have recently been crushed by new knowledge available from modern testing and research. Everything now shows that newborns have a highly capable immune system, but it's clamped down while it's learning about tolerance to self and tolerance to the environment and all of the microbes that that mother is passing to that baby. The anti-inflammatory status of newborns and young infants is controlled by breast milk, and it also is controlled by the placental uh, transfusion and stem cells. It's a necessary part of well-rounded immune development and functions totally different to a child's immune system, whether that child has memory immunity or not. These three hypotheses are only believable because the work that was needed to clarify Dr. Orby's concerns was never done. These are the considerations that were overlooked due to lack of study. Measles infections having beneficial effects was proven by Dr. Orby. But he talks about the erroneous assumptions in the research and immunization policies. And he remarked that those erroneous assumptions were maintained because the research examining the total impact of vaccination was never done. He said somewhat sarcastically that those calling the shots didn't want reality to contradict their erroneous assumptions and ideas. And that just like so many falsehoods in medicine, they're just considered true and not in need of scientific verification. Dr. Orby was studying diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccines in Africa and noticing that children who had those vaccines had a higher death rate than children who didn't. And that's where part of his commentary is coming from. He wanted to do more research and he was blocked from doing it by the World Health Organization. We continue to ask for more studies comparing vaccinated and non-vaccinated children and have yet to see them formally done because the science is settled and vaccines hit a home run. Yet still, there are no long-term studies looking for the most important non-specific effects. While we are told over and over that we're working with proven fact, the research that upholds current policy talks much about assumptions and theories and models and surprises. We have not progressed since Dr. Orby said this in 1995. In fact, we have gone backwards because Mina took some of those erroneous assumptions and based his three hypotheses on them. And we are told that Mina's three hypotheses solved a 50-year-long mystery. Now, these are a picture of my roommates in Virginia. Uh, we could take a break now, and this would be slightly more than the halfway point. Want to do that? And then I'll get to the 50-year-old mystery. <laughs> 